Hello and welcome to Thinking Critically, a D&D discussion, a podcast where we deep dive single word concepts or ideas within the Dungeons and Dragons 5e framework. My name is Danilo and I like all kinds of games and the crunchy mechanics that make him tick. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and I'd really appreciate a like or a follow. Today I'm joined by Adam Gumbert, aka Adam Gumby on Twitter. Thank you ever so much for joining us today adam can you tell us a little bit about yourself hey yeah appreciate you having me on i am adam gumby as everyone knows me online i do D D podcast i'll misfit roles i also do the editing for that uh, i've recently started um, a savage world game with some friends that's going to become a podcast pretty much my twitter is all it's either video games or tabletop rpgs and that is like what i do so a lot of podcasting a lot of D D a lot of video games that that's what i'm all about awesome perfectly qualified then for today's discussion <laughs> which is on the topic of archetypes so adam what does what does that word mean to you what does archetypes mean to you within the D framework yeah i mean archetypes can be looked at a couple different ways but basically it is what is like a preconceived notion or like what is a, it's a word like a character build or like an idea? That's, that's pretty much what it is. And I mm-hmm. here is what when you say this word, I think of this, and what that means is an archetype. So if I'm gonna, you know, just for example, I want to play, you know, like the the emo, you know, in the corner by myself, the thief. You know, clearly, you're playing a you're playing an emo rogue. Like that's mm-hmm. an archetype. Yeah, an emo rogue is an archetype. You know, that's basically what it is. But then archetypes were playing different kind of characters and playing against type i think where it gets really interesting personally yeah yeah i am a big fan of i've said it before of like subverting expectations and one way to do that is by playing against the archetype that you said so i i'm smiling now because i'm looking at my notes for this episode and i've literally got edgy rogue in quotes uh <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always there <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's. I guess it's just that the, the Aragorn trap, right? Although he's more of a ranger, I get it, but yeah. that that kind of like loner who sits in the corner of the of the bar kind of thing. Although I can't think of a better example of that. Uh, I mean, the, the thing with archetypes is that they normally work, so mm. that's why people do them. But I mean, like a good uh, of like the emo quiet. I mean, yeah, like any any adventure or you know any fantasy thing where it's like it's the quiet dude in the corner it's like we don't talk to him and it's just like oh he he can get stuff done i guess like robin hood would Mm -hmm. sort of be that like before he does the action stuff Mm. literally i mean any fantasy setting or even you know futuristic setting where it's like oh you need to get a job done go talk to this guy and then it's a smoky room and a dude's or a girl (laughs) sitting in a corner and it's like there's your rogue yeah yeah so i've broadly kind of approached this from a number of different ways the first one as we've started talking about it is player character so archetypical player characters now we broadly touched on this in the episode on roles so what kind of mechanical roles player characters can play tank healer and so on but i wanted to approach that from a from this angle the one we've been talking about so far of that edgy rogue or the 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 mother or father figure you know or those other kind of the 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 crazed barbarian i don't know if you've got any anecdotes or any any thoughts on how they maybe add value maybe are maybe a detriment to the game so in in the podcast i do i have misfit roles the the basics of that is that Think of like Suicide Squad, but like if that movie was good is the way that we say it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to think really hard. <laughs> I know. No Jared Leto, even though they said I'm Jared Leto in the game. But <laughs> we do we do have archetypes, but then we also come at it from that some of us are villainous or evil. You know, like Suicide Squad. They're not necessarily just like the big bad, mm-hmm. but they're, you know, that sort of a character. So like with the whole like the dad or the uh, like the, the fatherly figure in the group, like we have that. Sort of. We we make fun of him, say he has big dad energy, is our joke <laughs> that we have in the game. But it's he's our hobgoblin fighter. And, you know, he has to hide his face because in this world, monsters aren't, you know, everyone's like, oh, this guy's weird. Mm-hmm. But he definitely is like tries to corral the group, you know, in a good way and try to support everybody, even though like some of us are literally evil characters. <laughs> and some of us are just like imbeciles and don't understand the world. And like, again, it's that archetype of the pseudo leader and I'm keeping things in check, 
but it's like, I mean, he's, he's a big giant hobgoblin who's just trying his best to deal with these, <laughs> this group of idiots. <laughs> so it's like, there's the archetype, but here's a twist and makes it a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's nice. That just reminds me of a one shot I played probably over a year ago and I was playing a cleric and it was a really lent in to like the the mumsy archetypes. I was literally doing like a head count at one point, like you do on a field trip or something. Of like, okay, has everyone <laughs> made it through the portal? Okay, yes. Have you all got your buddies? Yeah. Okay. Right. Now we're gonna go and fight the beholder. <laughs> That's great. You guys got your lunch money. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I literally cast Heroes Feast. So <laughs> fantastic. As I said earlier on, I'm a fan of kind of subverting expectations so although i am all for having those tropes to use maybe an unfavorable term i do like having a little bit of it of a spin on them or the alternative is to lean so heavily into them you become almost like a self-parody <laughs> like yeah, a caricature of, of an archetype which can be fun too like if you go over the moon with it it can be real fun yeah yeah just like full on obviously it should still makes sense within the universe I, 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 I don't want to suggest anyone go and roll some you know kooky tightrope walking juggling bard in a grim dark <laughs> noir setting because that's just going to uh, probably not fit too well <laughs> it's a little weird yeah <laughs> so yeah there's there's the, the edgy rogue the emo rogue and my game does have uh, not so much emo more uh sociopathic <laughs> <laughs> but he's really lent into it and has shown signs of character development and i think that archetypes can be a good crutch to begin you know for certainly for newer players to say let me let me build and, and play with something that i'm familiar with or have at least seen you know a hundred times in pop culture but then the beauty of the game is that you can start to make it your own as you said like put a twist on it take it in a certain direction so using like a robin hood example maybe you don't become he's the prince of thieves right robin hood yeah like steals from the rich gives of the poor yeah yeah thing. so maybe like you don't become the prince of thieves kind of good guy robin hood you become maybe like a, a, a more kind of dark timeline <laughs> version yeah which obviously has its own coolness to it i think one thing we you and i discussed before recording was the concept of kind of anti-heroes uh so i don't know what your thoughts are on you know having player characters be anti-heroes do you think you need the whole party to be on the same page of of kind of that anti-hero vibe or is just one enough or what are, what are your thoughts I mean, well, the first thing is, is for the DM or the person running the game to understand what's going on. Because the thing that I personally don't like is, you know, when you have a party and someone's like, I want to be chaotic evil. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't like that idea of just like, I'm just going to kill this random person because I feel like it in the yeah. middle of the street. That's just a me thing. But um, the anti-hero thing definitely works. Like in our game... It works because we all understood when we were going into it, what we were doing, mm -hmm. and everybody realizes, like, what we're going for. So, even when some of us do actual evil things, it's understood, like, hey, this is the, the – and no one goes overboard, right? Yeah. Like, uh, as for me, my character, I'm the one who's done extremely evil thing, but, you know, in his mind, it was lawful, so it's no big deal. <laughs> but it was like, you know, I had to – for summon lesser demon, mm -hmm. you need – a vial of human blood killed in the last 24 hours. I'm like, you know what? I got to take somebody out. Um, so we were in a big town. I'm like, I told DM, I'm like, hey, I'm looking for a person. It can just be a drunk, just like a, some random person yeah, that like won't a vagrant. be missed. Yeah. yeah, just some just some, just some, some person, doesn't matter. And I was like, I told one of my friends, that the Hobgoblin, I was like, hey, can you watch my back real quick? So I didn't involve everybody. No one was uncomfortable. And I went out and I did it. And there's a whole crazy story with that. And that went insane. Mm-hmm. But it's like we understood what game we were going for. Yeah. I didn't force that decision on everybody. So it's not a big deal. And then, you know, we did such a good plan. The consequences haven't come back yet. So there's a way you can do it. Like I say, if you – everyone understands it and you plan it out, everyone's like, okay, that's fine. You know, my character's not there. It won't be a big deal. You can work it out. But, yeah, uh, if you're just like, um, you know, we're walking down the market. We're all in a good hero party. The wizard decides to be evil for a second and does a fireball in the middle of a crowded street. Like, mm -hmm. that, that's not necessary and kind of weird, but 
it's communication. If everyone understands what's going on, I think you can kind of pull off anything you want to do. Like any yeah. hero is very easy to do. It's just like, uh, you know, I don't care, but I guess I'll do a thing that's good, but I don't care. Like that's mm-hmm. easier than evil, but like it's communication. It's all about communication. Yeah, I think you've touched on a number of really good points there. And the one thing that I like to hammer home a lot is I absolutely see that chaotic evil is a thing and exists but it is not chaotic stupid so those examples you gave of walking downtown and i set the market on fire that's kind of like chaotic stupid because the consequences of those actions are well you're going to go you're going to get in trouble which doesn't really help anyone (laughs) and like you know fighting guards or the police and stuff like that that's that's just chaos for the sake of it and if you if you die then you can't create chaos anymore. So it's kind of counterproductive to set the marketplace on fire. So I'm a big proponent of, yeah, do do chaotic evil, but just do it in almost like a uh, an insidious way, which, as you said, is is difficult to do. It, it's, it's, it's definitely harder to play the extremes of the alignments than it is the middle ground, as you would expect to yeah. a certain extent. And the spell you mentioned, funnily enough, I used that in one of my, uh, in you know, main campaign that I play in. And now I feel probably worse than I did at the time. We were lucky that, uh, you know, my character was fortunate that they knew somebody who can, who can get things, you know, they're a fixer. And gotcha. I said, yeah, we've got a, we've got something coming up where I could use a lesser demon, funnily enough. So could you get me this component? And sure enough, a couple of hours later, they go, here you go. Don't worry about it. And so in that instance, my character is very much in a plausible deniability, ignorance is bliss situation. <laughs> and I probably haven't really grappled with the ramifications quite of what that meant. In universe, he was probably in denial and probably thought, hey, they probably, you know, they probably just went down to the morgue, you know, no one had to die. They just popped down to the morgue and it was all kosher natural causes i had nothing to do with this exactly yeah when in reality it almost definitely wasn't that so (laughs) Uh, and that spell is sick so yeah i'm i can totally see why you guys did that the the other thing i wanted to mention is as you said it's it's a communication thing and the ironic thing is is that in the game that i'm dming i'm probably the one least aligned and and i'm the dm and since we've been talking about Today, I've had the realization that my players are playing an anti-hero campaign. Mm -hmm. And up until that realization, I've been very much thinking that it's the typical hero fantasy. And uh, so I've I've been kind of jarring a little bit against don't kill these kobolds. You don't have to kill these kobolds because they're still living sentient creatures. But they're just like, well, it doesn't matter to us. Yeah, that's that's why we specifically went for the, you know, the evil, your bad guys game, because he was like, you're supposed to be heroes, but you literally will kill anybody who ever gets in your way. Like in a typical campaign, like you'll kill anybody, you'll steal if you have a rogue. He's like, mm-hmm. let's just lean into it. Forget it. Don't even worry about trying to be pretend to be goody two shoes, even mm-hmm. though a couple of our characters say that they're goody two shoes. He's like, well, we'll, let, we'll lean into it a little bit. Not too much, but you guys can. There's a reason that you guys do stupid <laughs> D&T stuff. Because you know, some of you guys are evil. That's fine. Yeah, I think I think that's probably the better way to do it. Just because it's it's easier to be a good character in a bad leaning party than it is to be a bad character in a good leaning party. I think because if you've got say four or five goody two shoes, you know, pious zealots, I won't even. I'll pay over the odds for. I, I'll never barter because they need to make a living wage kind of thing. The one rogue is just going to feel. Like he's going to get lynched. And in fact, that happened in the in-person campaign I, I'm playing or was playing in before we took it on hiatus where the rogue player in that was was very much a bad dude. And it got to the point where he, you know, said, damn, every, all the characters hate me. <laughs> so, yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, so my guy isn't really having a lot of fun because he's he's having to watch his back all the time. And can, can we take him in a direction where he maybe leaves the party and it ended up being your classic betrayal and he's now a minor bad guy that the dm is controlling and that player's come back as a as a like a furbolg bard or something that's just super friendly and <laughs> he's like a <laughs> oh, canadian nice. yeah and um 
Whereas if you're in, like you said, like slightly leaning into the bad guys kind of thing, I think it's ever so slightly easier to just play like the oblivious paladin. <laughs> yeah, just like I'm not in like I'm going to turn turn the other way. I'm not involved in this. Let me know if someone, you know, is doing evil. But if, you know, if didn't see it, didn't hear it, didn't happen, right? Yeah, yeah. And, or like I'm just going to go and pray today. So yeah, that, that just gives you guys. <laughs> yeah. And that just gives them the, the opportunity to do what they want kind of thing. So. So yeah, I think that's that's. I've had a weird epiphany since we've only been on fifteen minutes, and I've already had an epiphany. So I think, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's great. That's great. Um, if uh, for those that you know listen to the podcast, they'll know that I'm on a, a holiday now. Actually, by the time this comes out, I'll probably be back in the DM seat after having a couple months off. And I guess the biggest takeaway for me from doing this podcast, and especially this episode, is that the people I've talked to and everything I've learned. I'm going to come back a much better DM. So thanks <laughs> that's good man more experience more viewpoints you know, make for a better game i've learned stuff to do and you know whenever we get back to uh doing season two i've learned some things that i can do you know listening to people's podcasts and people's experience i'm like yeah i'll definitely change that up mm, mm, yeah oh, great i'm i'm feeling super chuffed now uh <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about um player character archetypes yeah yeah anti-heroes your, your hero heroes uh there's probably a, a tv tropes term for hero heroes rather than the one i'm just making up on the spot but <laughs> true heroes <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but that's a good segue there into dm archetypes so my comment on this was there is a bit of a archetype around kind of adversarial dungeon masters your tomb of horrors dungeon masters uh so what kind of what's what's do, do you dm at all i guess is a good question start off a yeah i have in the past i dm'd for about two years before i got in the campaign i was like hey and it was one of my players who actually dms that campaign i'm like thank god you take over because i just want to play <laughs> at this point but yeah i did it for for quite a while for a couple different groups ah cool so what what style what kind of archetypical dm would you consider yourself and perhaps the, the player that took over what about them and and how do they differ it changes when you first dm ever it's that like over prepared archetype where it's like i've got to make sure everything is right every person has a name and every situation has a possible outcome and then when you learn uh, might as well throw that out the window that doesn't necessarily matter mm. so much uh, broad strokes is better than trying to do fine lines for me anyways i got to the point where i was just I got silly, really, because um, I had a bunch of groups that, uh, like, they would go for a little bit, then, you know, half the people would leave or whatever. So I'm like, all right, we're going to do a, a West Marches style where it's just you guys have a base, and whenever you can show up, make whatever character you want, make a new one, bring your old one, and I have one shots, and we're just going to play a bunch of one shots. Mm -hmm. And then I, I got – it was all real silly and real fun. Like, one of them, we literally met Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> he was a monk hanging out. I was just like, you know – at this point where everyone's just people are non-committal and then certain people want to play a lot i'm like i'm not going to do a big overarching campaign mm -hmm. um i want to but it's too difficult you know mm -hmm. people going in and out i was like let's just have fun so i was like they're like i want to try this i'm like you know what roll it i don't care <laughs> let's let's figure it out and if you fail it'll be fun and if you succeed we'll re you know i'll explain the ridiculousness of you doing a backflip over a moving cart to like steal a coin purse off the top or whatever <laughs> so yeah i definitely turned to that like we're just going to be silly and, and go over the top and have fun hmm yeah that's nice of just that the freedom uh of both the players and for yourself just to have that silliness as you said for uh myself i'm in a in a big campaign dm big campaign along well, oh, man, it's 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 gonna. It feels like forever, and it feels like it's gonna go on forever due to me doing a little bit too much and the players taking longer than I would have expected. Oh, I I know all about that. <laughs> yeah, which I probably should have seen coming. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm adjusting future campaign arcs and seasons accordingly by uh, bringing down some of the complexity just to make it so we're not retired by the time we finish <laughs> but how, how do you feel about that kind of adversarial dm archetype but the more older school one of i'm here to fight the players it's an interesting one i think de again depending on the game you're playing it can be absolutely fine so you know i mostly play D. &D. i just started playing savage worlds mm -hmm. um 
because that, you know, why did DM who wanted to run that? And I was like, sure, I'll give it a try. And that game is just a lot more, it's an adversarial, just on the basis that like anybody can get one hit at any time, just based on how that's how dice go. So it's like in that campaign, I'm just ready for anybody to die at any point because that's how it's supposed to be. So I'm fine with that there. It can be a problem where if everyone thinks like, oh, this is going to be, you know, I'm going to level up this character. We're going to just do whatever we want. You know, not necessarily in a bad way, but it's like, you know, we have goals. We're going to finish them off. And the DM's like maybe has different plans and mm-hmm. those plans don't line up. I can definitely see that being a problem. I've been lucky to not play in that kind of game. Um, I definitely have seen it. And I know people have told about it. Again, I, that's also another communication thing because I, I think there's nothing wrong with uh, like a deadly game or an adversarial game. Mm-hmm. But players need to be prepared for what they're getting into mm-hmm. because the, it's always the problem where, you know, everyone's playing. They understand what's going on. And the one person's like, well, I wanted to be able to do this and I'm upset that I can't do this. I'm like, well, someone should have known what was going on at some point here. I'm not saying anyone's wrong or anyone's right. So you should have known what you're getting into. And if it's not your kind of game, you know, you can be polite and either fix it or, or not deal with it. But people want to stay around. And that's where the adversary comes in where it's like. When people aren't matching up and no one wants to figure out a way to fix it. So, like, that's definitely a thing. Like, there are people, archetypes, like, this is how I'd run games. This is how I'm doing it because I've been playing for 30 years. And a new player might not like that. Mm. And it's just, like, that's how this, this game is. Mm. Yeah, a couple of interesting points in that. I'm, it's it's weird. I, I my, my experience is limited in this sense in that, apart from one time, I've only ever played with people I know friends colleagues but girlfriend um (laughs) that kind of stuff the one time i played with strangers in person going back about three years at this point wasn't particularly enjoyable let's just say they were playing a different game and i'll leave it at that oh that was them playing the mtg game right (laughs) yes (laughs) Yeah, see, if you were expecting one thing and then that's what you got with them trying to do a completely different system and playing for themselves, yeah, I would not want to play that game. I understand that completely. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. Uh, and, you know, I, I approached it quite maturely, if I do say so myself, of just, you know, politely declining to return. But even with playing with friends, it's still, as I said earlier on, like my hero-hero idea of my current game is, is patently not true. And the more I try to bend it to be that, the more there's going to be friction and issues. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. Do you think your player who turned DM, player turned DM, uh, do you think he was impacted at all or was uh, kind of uh, inspired at all by yourself? He very much um, seemed to be like the way you explain it, where... He seemed extremely prepared, had a, a a broad idea for it, and we're still going on that path. But us as players, uh, the, knowing this as the editor who gets to cut out, you know, the things that you know aren't important to the story. Yeah. It's like there's a lot of a lot of dicking around, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's fun. It's great in the moment. But him being like, "All right, here's my giant plan," and then sometimes we'll uh, take longer. So he's learned from he's learned to DM for us better. I think is mm. is what I'm getting at. So. Like, we went to a town, and we had, like, this big giant adventure, or, you know, like a session and a half there doing our thing. And he's like, I had literally two sentences written down because you were just supposed to go through here. But we played it by ear, and I figured it out because I know you guys can get caught up on literally <laughs> anything, and then we'll be here for a little bit. So, he's learned to – he still has his style, his, you know, his overall plan that he has. But he, he's left wiggle room to cater to the way that we play, you know, not breaking, but bending – for mm-hmm. the way that that we play, which I think I think he's uh, a really good DM. I think I like his style more than I liked my own when I was doing it. To be honest, <laughs> oh, well, that's that, that is high praise. Good on him. So we talked about dungeon masters and what role they fit in, but now we've we've had that discussion. And I can think about it. It definitely seems almost like a redundant question because the nature of the game and the nature of that position is so fluid that there isn't really an archetype there there can't be because it's so you know differs from table to table from person to person and party to party it's just a unique combination of the whole is greater than some of its parts almost which is 
Interesting. I mean, the th- there can be archetypes for DMs, mm-hmm. but if they're not fluid at all, that's where you can run into problems. Mm-hmm. So I guess there's one. <laughs> the not fluid DM. <laughs> yeah, like, now this is the way I'm doing it where I'm, I'm not changing for anything. It's like, oh boy, this is going to be a long one. Yeah, yeah. I, I pride myself on having the flexibility to change, but things have to be justifiable in universe, justified to me, and have kind of like a, a contextual reasoning to do so so like taking the backflip example or whatever if you can sell it to me essentially then we're good to go it almost uh, it almost comes across like a you know a dragon's den shark tank kind of thing when players want to do stuff i'm like well let me hear you out come on put your proposal on the table why do you want to how how do you how are you going to do this when i kick flip off of this and i jump on the crate and then i swing from the light and then I turn upside down and th- okay, that's dope. Absolutely, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, hit at least a twenty on a dex check, and you can do that. I do not care how you have at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. And, uh, and a couple of homebrew things that have come across of, of players saying like, "Oh, it'd be cool if if I had this, or I'd like to build this." And yeah, uh, we've we we've, we've got there in the end, despite some initial trepidation on my part due to well anxiety, which um. <laughs> you know i've got better at so hey there's there's uh, some some progression for you there that's good i actually do have a thing that i thought of since we've been talking about uh-huh. archetypes which is this definitely varies from dm to dm you have the people feel a way whatever they want about matt mercer but there's a matt mercer style where it's mm-hmm. like very descriptive tries to do character voices you know that kind of a thing which is you know not everyone has that ability but it's very cool when you can do it mm-hmm. you know and then you also have the um I think it's Harmon Quest. I've never watched it fully, but I've had people talk to me about it where he like doesn't do any voices. He's very straightforward, like he's reading from a book and you play it like mm. that. So I guess, again, I, I think it's Harmon Quest. I might be wrong. I've never listened to it, so I don't want to mm-hmm. misquote it. But there's definitely the person who's the DM who's like, I do voices. I want to do a lot of social stuff. Uh, there's uh, DMs who look at the three pillars differently. Mm-hmm. So some people are just like, you know, there's social stuff, you know, just talk to them, roll it, we're done. And those other people are like, let's have a full conversation. The way you talk to me will affect how these, you know, there mm-hmm. are people who approach the game differently, not necessarily a style or an archetype, but like hard line, this is what I do. And then other people are like, this is how I do it. Like I want to do mostly a, like I've never done a dungeon crawl because to me that doesn't sound extremely exciting. I like mm-hmm. doing dungeon parts, but I like doing I like a 50-50 of social and yeah. uh, of combat stuff. And there are DMs who are just like, yo, it's going to be 80% combat. And I'm not doing voices because that's only 20% of my game. So I'm not doing social stuff in depth like somebody who would do, you know, either a 50-50 or like a 70-30. Mm-hmm. Like I want to do a lot of social and we'll have a little bit of combat because it's fun. But that's an archetype for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I I mean, you can be the Matt Mercer archetype if you're a trained, you know, <laughs> career professional. You've got to be good actor. to be Matt Mercer. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, yeah, I can see why people w- want to be like that. But it is it is a fine line, especially if you're writing the fluff yourself, like narrative fluff. It, you know, none of us are, well, I imagine very few of us are creative writers. You know, the, there is the Venn diagram sometimes overlaps, but mm. I, I imagine most dms aren't creative writers by trade so writing good fluff for rooms and regions and areas can be quite easy to get wrong like you just talk garbage for 10 minutes and at the end your players are like what was that <laughs> what okay i got bored halfway through because you were just where's talking. the door at that's all i need to know yeah yeah because you were just talking about the grains of sand and the, the dust and the, the the species of squirrel that inhabit this area <laughs> and <laughs> like it's you know tight rope walking that fine line of here's enough thematic juice but not just superfluous garbage that no one cares about yeah, because then you have the opposite where it's like you walk in a room uh, from the south. Uh, there's a door to the north. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> Anything else going on, DM? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Like those literal like Amiga dungeon crawlers, which are literally like forward, left, right, forward, left, right. Like we've we, we've we've come so far since then. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm completely of the same school of thought as you, as yours. I I'll, I'll add a dungeon in where it's necessary. But it is always 
thematic. If anyone were to say it's it's a dungeon crawl, that would be a failure in my eyes on my part. If they if they felt that way about it, because I want it to be more than that. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I was the exact same way. I'm like big open spaces. We'll go inside once in a while to do stuff. It's like yeah, let's not just. All right, I'm in the dungeon now. I don't like that people to feel that way. But again, it's just a personal thing. That's that's mm-hmm. my my thing. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So we've talked about DMs. Let's loop back around. And I've got a really juicy one at the end that I'm, I'm keeping on, on the back. So let's before we get there, let's talk about typical players. And I'll open up the discussion with the obvious one. About as obvious as the emo rogue, we have the rules lawyer. Mm, yes. So have you got any experience of that type of player? You know, good, bad... What are your thoughts? So I've got it. It depends. You're right. When you say rules lawyer, it normally feels bad. Yeah. Uh, Because it can be where someone's talking over you like, but actually no one wants to hear that. And the games I've played are quote unquote rules lawyer is a guy who's got about 30 years of experience. And it's like, oh, how does this work? He's like, hold on. Actually, I think it's like this. So it's more of an ask and a tell instead of just interrupt and tell. Mm -hmm. And then playing a wizard. I have to know all that stuff. <laughs> uh, so if anyone else, so we have, you know, like I'm a full wizard. We have someone else who was an arcane trickster and then they took a level in wizard. So I'm like, if you got questions, you know, I, I believe me, I've read over it enough. I can help you out. Mm-hmm. But I'm not like, hey, you're doing your spell wrong. It's like, hey, how did, wait a minute. Am I I'm like, oh, yeah, it's this, you're good. Have mm-hmm. at it. And then, like I said, the guy who's got tons of experience, like we look at him like, hey, you know what's going on? He's like, oh, yeah, I got you. So that's a good type. But there's, I had a couple of experiences, not going to name names, of where it's bad. Where it's like, can I just play? <laughs> can I just play the game? Can we just play the game? He's like, actually, we need to, you would need the component. It's like, all right, I understand. But, you know, you could you could say this nicer, I suppose. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been fortunate enough not to have ever experienced a proper, like, the, the, the negative version of a rules lawyer and you're right it does have a negative connotation probably wrongly so because i'd imagine nine times out of ten it's more what you described of i've got a question how does this work again so i'm I'm fortunate enough to have one or two of those in in my game as my players and they are often because i'm forgetful and it's just like god i can't remember if you get hit when you're incapacitated is that a death save or is that a crit i you know can someone tell me (laughs) yeah and they usually jump in there and are like, oh, it's this. Or it's, yeah, it's two death saves and a crit and this, that, and the other. And and, and that's how they lawyer us to have fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Lawyers can be good. Especially like when you're at that mid to upper levels mm-hmm. where, yeah, if you have someone else who's played a high level spellcaster and it's your first time, absolutely look for it. Because there's, it can get complicated. That's why they tell new players to play a fighter. Because <laughs> the spellcasting <laughs> can get pretty hard when you get up there. Yeah, yeah. I funnily enough, in the the actual play podcast, I mean, I also play a wizard. I think we're level ten ish, give or take. And same, y- yeah. It's there's the court is big, and you got a lot of balls to throw around. <laughs> One of the players in a, in a in a short campaign I'm running, uh, I, t- I took over the DM for a little while. I think I've mentioned it way earlier on in an earlier episode, but uh, he literally pendulum swung from playing a barbarian and then in the short campaign we're playing now, a wizard. And I was like, okay, dude, you have just, you know, no disrespect to barbarians. My favorite character I'm playing right now is my barbarian. It's sick. I love him. But he has just opened that book and and seen that there's like 10 more chapters. (laughs) That that Now he has to, to learn. And... A good anecdote of that is before we started, I was sitting through and was like, just just be careful because uh, wizards and their spell books are a bit of a minefield with trying to work out how many spells you have versus learnt versus a prepared. prepared yeah. yeah. So I was like, be a bit careful because it's very easy to, to, to screw up there. And we're using D&D Beyond and it doesn't, I think on D&D Beyond, you can just keep adding spells because it, you might pick them up, you know. As a wizard, you can just pick up new spells as you're walking around. So, so we went through that, and I explained to him on all that, and then he's, like, "Oh, this isn't. I need. Uh, c- c- can I have some more spells that I've learned through our traveling? We've gone through, 
And I'm like, dude, you're literally the most flexible class. You've gone from no spells to the class with the most flexibility and you still want more. So that was my first thought process there of, I don't know, maybe something's not quite correct in his understanding because this is like the most flexible you can be. Yeah, and the most utility of, yeah. of pretty much any class. So we, we, we basically agreed, yeah, okay, let's say you would have started with 500 gold. You can spend that to transcribe spells into your book until you've run out of that money. So we ended up, you know, adding, say, five more than a, a regular wizard who never found any spells would be at that point, which is where I find my wizard set. Mm. And we're a couple of sessions in now, and I don't know whether it's ironic or awkward or whatever, but I, I can probably count on one hand the number of spells he's cast. Uh, Arcane Eye, Fireball, Invisibility, Witch Bolt, Silence, and that might be it, actually. Some cantrips, and that's about it. Huh? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, obviously, um, oh, Magic Missile, six. Sorry, two hands. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but obviously out of a pool that he went to great lengths to expand and, you know, off the top of my head, you know, in your book at level 11, you've probably got about 25 spells, if not yeah. more. Yeah, I'm looking right now just to have fun. I pulled up my D&D Beyond sheet for my character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a ninth level wizard. I have 36 known spells, mm-hmm. four cantrips, and I can have uh, 14 normal spells prepared. Prepared, yeah. Uh, and that's a level nine wizard. I did, I think find a spell book or two in there mm-hmm. but most of that is just level up naturally and a couple here and there and yeah i don't even i, I don't i don't use half of these no. <laughs> i haven't used half of these first level spells like after we got through like our first arc and i've never used this stuff again but it's, yeah. it's so much available yeah for sure for sure so he, he was almost what's the opposite of analysis paralysis he was just like a glutton for like suddenly someone's just opened the door and say said gone wild go wild with these spells so he's just gone i want more i want more i want more but then when we've actually played he's like actually i can't you know this is never really gonna work or this one like it sounded good on paper but it's actually kind of crap uh never use it in real life yeah yeah. like this one i can't ever cast because it's concentration and i'm usually concentrating on this other one so there was a there was a gap there in his knowledge where perhaps a, a rules lawyer would have been useful to, to him ahead of time. Yeah, I, I did that whenever I was making it. I looked at the guy with all the experience and I was like, you know, I'm picking the two spells for my level up. I'm thinking between these four. What do you think? He was like, those are some good ones. That fourth one, probably not going to be used. And I'll read mm-hmm. through it again. I'm like, man, you're probably right. So that definitely saved me from wasted spells. So that, that rules lawyer, quote unquote, was, <laughs> was a good thing to have. <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, we're almost finished with that, but that was a good learning experience for him to be like, okay, it isn't all what it's cracked up to be, just to to really, you know, let those floodgates open. But I think after all of this discussion, what's probably the best outcome is that rules lawyers should probably see themselves more as a mentor, that mentorship role of, I've been here, let me help you out. And I, I you know, I love it when, when I'm in the middle of DMing and there's a numbers are flying left right and center and there's a million one things going on and someone just goes oh actually uh you, you've you've forgotten about this and i'm like, oh thank goodness because <laughs> thank you for that you know just just more of that mentorship between players i think is probably a more wholesome and positive way to approach it yeah and that's way it, it seems to be most of the time so that's mm-hmm. that's probably the word we should use from now on right yeah yeah there you go. Let's, let's start a, a campaign to distance ourselves from the maligned connotations of uh, rules lawyering. <laughs> rules lawyer to rules mentor. Let's go. There we go. I don't know if there's any other types of players that you've come across that would, would, would fit an, you know, a, an archetype, positive or a negative one. I mean, there definitely are. I, I, it, it's sort of why certain players pick certain classes because mm-hmm. you'll have – your your lone wolf, which you know, do a lot of rogues and stuff, where it's like, hey, I've got to steal everything, and I'm doing this all on my own. Like when the party goes to sleep, I sneak off and do my own thing, mm-hmm. which which is interesting. I mean, it's nice to keep a party together, but there's definitely a, a, that certain person who will leave the party and do their own thing. Uh, that's again, that's not always a detriment. Sometimes it can be fun where this person comes back and like, oh, we've uh, we figured out this puzzle. Uh, we know where this guy is at that we need to find. And uh, I've also got an extra 500 gold. It's like, 
right? I mean, I guess those are positive things, but it's like we're about to go into uh, the meeting with the with the king, and it's like, oh, you're your guy's not back yet, so you're down a party member. It's like, oh. So there's going to be positive and negative to the, I guess I would call it like a lone wolf. Mm-hmm. And again, you can't really play D&D with a one person. I've never seen it, a, one, a one DM, one player. Um, <laughs> so I guess they have to play with a group. But yeah, that th- there's an archetype of people who like, I'm going to do my thing because my character would do this. It's like, mm-hmm. I guess. So my good DM friend of mine, Jamie, who was on the previous episode that's literally went out about six hours ago, Funnily enough, his first experience was a one-on-one with myself. Um, <laughs> Interesting. I've never seen it. I mean, it wasn't, you know, a typical game. I think it goes without saying. It was, you know, we were we were catching up. We were having a lot of drinks as well uh, that helped. And I had to do a lot of hard work to, to balance. Because obviously balancing a one PC party is, you know, the framework is just in the bin at that point. So I think his, his first combat as a level one character was with... with like three cats like literally like <laughs> cr zero cats <laughs> that's about as fair as it, as it could get so trying to um you know crowbar that in in the narrative of what like why are three tabbies fighting you was <laughs> was was half the fun that's great yeah the the lone wolf uh thing i was worried when you were starting talking that we were going to get into like a psychoanalytical human being <laughs> thought process of you know personality types and stuff but um yeah so lone wolf is is one and uh one i don't have a huge amount of experience with myself but i think the more tricky issue you touched on was kind of that's what my guy would do so mm-hmm. probably with a worse a justifiably worse reputation than a rules lawyer we've got the my guy syndrome as it's known i don't know if you've had any experiences with that at all yeah, for sure. Where it's, yeah, like we were talking about earlier with like the chaotic person like catching yep. up a market on fire. Where it's like, yeah, nobody would do that. He's like, well, maybe my guy would do that. So I have to play what my, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's, I've been lucky to not experience it too much, but it's like once in, I, I've actually, when I was DMing, I had a, a character do that and it was fine because it was like the silly, uh, mm-hmm. moving towards mm-hmm. the silly campaign thing, but it was like, I, I don't, I don't, this isn't fun for anybody. I don't really think, this makes sense but it's like yeah my guy would would try to as a barbarian rob like a highly secure thing and literally just like almost kill all the just the town guard they're just doing their job and he's like mm-hmm. yeah but i want that thing in that building is my character would just would just take it it's like i guess um but again it was it was silly so it didn't cause too many problems but mm-hmm. i could see in a more serious campaign like uh, you can't just do whatever you want to do and not expect consequences and then don't get mad about the consequences i guess when it happens yeah yeah, but that's see, this is this is where I'm struggling. So again, so I'll start from the top. I'm I'm lucky, and you have never had like a really egregious example of I'm going to murder the rest of the party because that's what he would do. Well, and it's never been that bad. I've had a few minor instances in the past. I was playing with my very first kind of proper group where it was where it was like, well, I just want to do this because I'm in a strop now. Okay, I'll humor you this time, but uh, <laughs> actions will have consequences. Yep. But that example of you know, we were talking about I should enable my anti-hero players to be anti-heroes. But then on the same hand, I'm trying to teach them that actions will have consequences. So I've got a thought process coming up where they've just gone through a kobold dungeon. And they have been particularly chaotic, shall we say, uh, merciless. Mm. They're, you know, they're not taking prisoners. Some kobolds have died you know, through betrayal, you know, they've said, oh, we won't kill you. Tell us what we need to know. And then they'll, they'll kill him. You know, they've burnt a couple of the bodies just in case there was any kind of magic stuff happening. So it's been pretty brutal carnage, I have to say. And I am toying with the idea of there being some kind of, you know, celestial comeuppance that they might have to meet, you know, some, some, some kind of payment for their, almost genocidal crimes and now i'm like oh maybe i shouldn't do that because it's you know i'm back into the you're not playing heroes and this is me kicking you in the ass i don't know there's a so there's like a middle point to that where it's like you can give them if it makes sense a consequence right Mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be like an end-all be-all consequence like you could say one of them survived and made it out 
and then they have a small group that attacks the party in the night whenever they find them, you know, a month later or whatever. It's not going to be a deadly combat. No one's going to die. But it's mm-hmm. like, hey, when you do things, bad things. Or like you say, with the celestial thing, you could have some sort of holy figure be like, you need to get it together or there's going to be a lot bigger problem. You know, however you want to play, you know, mm-hmm. depends on your world and, and the way that your characters act. But like they can do bad things and then there could be consequences that aren't necessarily a TPK. That doesn't have to be the only consequence. Yeah. Um, it could straight up be like people in town heard about the horrible things you do. No one wants to deal with you in this town. So, like, you got to just move on because no one likes you anymore because mm. you're awful people. Like, that's – again, that's that's not the end of the campaign. No one's going to die. But it's like well, that really inconveniences people. So, maybe, you know, you could still be who you want to be. You can be an antihero. But just like – I don't know. Don't do, be crazy or, you know, do it quietly, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a life lesson right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can be bad if no one catches you. <laughs> oh, God. I don't know what we're promoting now. We've, we've, we've gone into some some dark corner of this podcast. Your words, not mine. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> uh, okay, now that, that is reassuring because, you know, I think that would be something good. And they've, they've had something similar in the past where, you know, a, a former ally has tried to distance themselves from the, from the players because they've said, you know, I, I don't want to associate with you guys anymore because of your antics so soz but you're on your own now and they've had had to turn to more nefarious allies in due kind which is actually now think about it a kind of cool feedback loop of we did bad things we have to talk to bad people which are going to encourage us to do more bad things which is going to encourage us to talk to more bad people so i guess we're still talking about my guy syndrome just in in a way of you know yeah, ensure that their actions have consequences and try and leverage that into a positive way. Now, you know, obviously there's a limit and there's extremes. And if, if one player is just being a knob and is, is actively diminishing the fun, then get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if it's, if it's, you know, light touches here and there, then yeah, lean into it, make sure actions have consequences and you'll come out the other side with a hopefully a more interesting game yeah i I think the people who do the my guy and stick to it don't probably last in a group very long Mm -hmm. it's a thing where it's like hey maybe you do a my guy once you grow from it or you move past it or there's small consequences but like Mm -hmm. i don't i don't see a group where the my guy is there for like five sessions straight i Mm -hmm. i as a player or as a team i'd be like all right i mean we gotta figure out a new character or something because this is (laughs) no one's having fun with this yeah Okay, so to get onto the a juicy topic then of the archetypal enemies. So we've talked outside of the table. We've talked, you know, players and DMs as, as human beings. We've talked in the game as player characters. And so the other side of that coin to bring it to a close is the non-player characters. And um, what best to talk about than the big bad evil guys, the villains, the enemies. So what kind of villain archetypes are there what kind of tropes and positions do they fill within a campaign there's two that you always get and actually i think i'll try to remind myself that there's actually an interesting one that i I don't see very often that i think really cool but of course you've got at the beginning it's like small time crime boss Mm -hmm. it's just like your first obstacle at level one it's like ah i'm running I'm running a fence in the smallest town you're in at the beginning. And it's it was like that first human character that you have to overcome is like, he's a small time dude. And it's like, oh, big thing because you're level one or level two. Mm. And then it immediately ratchets up to, uh, you know, I'm a guy who's literally going to destroy the planet if you don't stop me. And it's that those are the two you're going to always see in, in like a big broad campaign. Little guy just, you know, making his living illegally mm. and then. You know, a guy who's going to cut the world in half with a sword if you let him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny when you when you lay it out like bookends like that. It is, it does make me smile. The breadth of the game and how much you can have player character growth between levels one to twenty. I don't like to think about it too much because it kind of smashes the fourth wall for me a little bit. Yeah, but um, yeah, I've gone with. Uh, there is obviously a big, a big bad evil guy in my campaign who is a a lich who has got some nefarious plans. Now, this is a slight spoiler warning. Should any of my players listen, but his end goal—it's a classic. 
well, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil, uh, to mm. quote Star Wars Episode Three. So from his point of view, it's legit, right? His thing is, what he's trying to do is is right, is just, is this is going to make sense and the outcome will be for the benefit of everybody in my world view. So I was trying to think earlier on, like we have anti-heroes. Are there also anti-villains? Is that a thing? Um, I feel like it must be a thing. Oh, absolutely. So again, our DM says that um, he's like, I don't always succeed at this, but I want my bad guys to be the the good guys of their own story, right? Which is Mm -hmm. a great way to write those people. So yeah, like a perfect example that I think is in Black Panther, Killmonger. Mm. I mean, he's the bad guy of the story, but he's really like, he's entitled to the throne. Uh, Because he is of that bloodline, Mm -hmm. Uh, he was left. He was left in poverty and abandoned by his own family after his family killed his father. Mm. So him wanting to come back and take his place on the throne isn't really wrong. Like he's entitled to it, and he was wronged by his own family. Mm -hmm. So again, if you take the movie, I mean, that movie's really basically about Killmonger more than it even is about Mm T'Challa. And it's like, yeah, like I, you know, again. Because it's a movie, he's the bad guy. He's like, oh, well, I'm going to send guns out and kill people. Whatever, fine. But his personal story is like, I'm just trying to get home where I deserve to be. And it was taken from me as a child. Mm. So it's like, is he is he wrong for thinking that? I wouldn't think so. Like, mm. he was wronged by everybody. And all he wanted to do was go home. Mm. Yeah, that is a really good example of that. And that, I, love, I love the line you, you quoted there of a good villain should be the hero of their own story. Which obviously gives you a lot of leeway there. And here's a summary oh. from the website Masterclass. The villain is the antagonist of your story, whose motivations and actions are those of the protagonist. Wow. Okay. Cool. I mean, I don't have to record That's anymore because. Uh... Dan Brown advocates for writing your villain first, even before. Okay, Google. The... Stop. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, let me tell you how this works. Yeah, let's, let's just get her to record all the podcasts from now on. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> God, I'm completely lost my train of thought. I was just saying, um, there's a lot of leeway for having villains feel like the hero of their own story because obviously their worldview can be uh, delightfully twisted <laughs> to fit the narrative that you want. Yeah. And well, there's a there's a there's a type of NPC I want to bring in who is kind of like the enemy of the enemy is my friend kind of thing. So I want there to be this rival person this kind of slightly antagonistic npc but they kind of get on with Mm. i just haven't thought of it yet (laughs) (laughs) yeah well the one i was thinking of you know before i you know i answer the question is i've always wanted to see and our dms talked about maybe doing it but he's like you wouldn't be the only adventuring party in the world it's like of course Mm -hmm. we wouldn't why would we be the only you know five six seven whatever people doing what we're doing so i would love the idea of maybe not the the big bad and evil guy but another or another adventuring party yeah. who is you know they're out there you're, they're your adversaries and you're like you know like you show up to the to a you know clean out the goblin camp or you got to get this artifact so you can kill you know the guy who's going to cut the world in half with the sword and it's like they're already there and they've already done it and you're like you're going to be confrontational but they're like yo like we're just we're just doing the thing to stop this guy right mm-hmm. but to you they'd be adversary and then of course my idea is that it's it's a mirror version of you. So it's like, because <laughs> I play a, a, Gith, a Gith Yankee wizard. Cool. Because I like playing weird races. Mm-hmm. So I'd love if there was uh, the Githsarai wizard on the other yeah. side. It's like, I would I would Ooh. love just the idea of Bizarro mirror us. Yeah. Just like being our adversaries. <laughs> <laughs> so great minds again. So I've done something very similar in my campaign. And they were literally passed on ships going in opposite directions on the river. <laughs> And so my players made up of a bunch of classes and a bunch of races. Obviously, my my party are. What I'd done is I'd basically shuffled them around. So instead of having a total sorcerer, it was a total druid. Mm. And instead of having this and the other, it, they, I just rotated them all, kind of shifted them down one. Apart from one combination, the human warlock for reasons that will become apparent later in the campaign uh-huh. as a kind of a, a linchpin divining rod to the group but yeah they literally passed each other on ships and we're kind of looking over the banisters and we're like hang on a minute that looks a bit weird and obviously it was also uh interesting because they 
the party that they were passing was traveling towards where they'd just done their quest. Mm-hmm. So it was like, well, why are they going there? Hang on, that's an adventuring party going to where we've just come and got treasure and killed a boss and stuff. So yes, I would absolutely try and squeeze that in because my players were on that, on it like Sonic. They were. They it's were so over fun, it. and people don't do it enough. But it's just, I love that. It's like. I don't know how much you like bad movies, but I think it's Fast and Furious 7 or 6 <laughs> yeah. where they, they make a joke like the other squad that's doing the crimes is literally just the, their crew but reversed. <laughs> and they make a joke. I, was, I just love it's like, oh, I've got to fight me. But, you know, he wears white instead of red. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I even made the names anagrams of the names of the players, which is probably the most difficult part because – fantasy names don't often work <laughs> yeah it's tough <laughs> if you start moving those letters around they're already kind of you know iffy names in some cases so uh, so yeah that is a very good because you're just playing with the archetype of the play, like the player party you're using as an archetype and you're building mm. from that so yeah i would recommend and now i want to now how excited i'm getting thinking about it i'm gonna have to try and uh, make that a bigger part i think when we oh, go it back is- it's so fun. Another archetype I like, um, this is sort of the way a game's run, but it has to do with, with the villain or, you know, the NPC, is there's an idea of running a campaign. So, you know, a lot of campaigns where, you know, you'll go on a, a mission, you know, a couple sessions, you'll be doing a thing and you take, you know, the DM's like, all right, what's a cool thing in the monster manual? That's, a, you know, a CR of the of the group and we'll fight that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's another idea for a campaign um, might be like in shorter arcs, but sort of a – you look at a cool monster in the book, right? So mm-hmm. say it's like a CR 12 or a 13 or, or whatever it is, right? And that is your campaign. Is that this monster that would normally be at the end of, you know, an adventure, you know, like short term, uh, you, you kill it. It's like, all right, well, we're going on this quest and, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a gibbering mouther or whatever mm-hmm. they're called. And yeah. that's – we fight that. That's the big fight and then we move on. But the idea is like, you know – uh, we're going to take like an abolith, which is pretty strong. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, Tarasque level strong, but it, it's pretty strong. And that is the bad guy for the entire thing. It's like this is the this is the thing we're fighting against. So there's not necessarily progressions of a crime boss to the god trying to kill the king to the god trying to destroy the world. Yeah. It is here is this thing that's pretty powerful. And this is the goal of this campaign. Those campaigns are normally shorter, but it's also an interesting idea of just like, here's a thing, and we're going to base everything off of this. Because mm-hmm. like you look at specifically like an Abolith, or you can do it with like a hag, where it's like the powers they can do, it's like control people. Did it? Like you can make an entire, like you go to three or four towns before you yeah, end sure. up finishing this thing off because like they can control people's minds. So it's like you go to the first village and this one dude's acting weird and we have to fight that. We're low level, higher level. You know, some of its minions have invaded this other town and the, like the last town, everyone's mind controlled mm. and you've got to kill the Abolith to free the town. And like that could be, you know six seven sessions and there's your you know quote unquote campaign mm-hmm. i like that idea for a, a bad guy archetype where it's just here's a one thing that's pretty cool and that's what it is i guess it's sort of like the idea of strahd except for when you play that there's a lot more things you have to fight but the idea mm-hmm. of like here's a thing that's not in, impossible to kill but this is the main adversary for our adventure mm-hmm. yeah there's, there's quite an elegant purity to that because almost you don't even need to level up during that if it's gauged correctly or maybe once or twice just to make it fair but yeah there's quite a nice like self-containment to it yeah you could start at level five and end at level nine because mm-hmm. you guys have already been adventuring you're of course you know you're not a level one character wouldn't be go on to fight a cr15 monster like that would not be where they start but let's say you've already been adventuring for a year you go from five to eight you fight this monster here's our here's our little mini arc we had mm-hmm. yeah my yeah as i said my villain is delightfully obtuse to my players so far in the campaign you know big spouting monologues a couple times of this that and the other like you guys are are fun though those (laughs) are fun they're real fun i I am looking forward i'm i'm a dingus because i spent way too long writing his final monologue Mm -hmm. which the players won't get to probably like two years and they might half of them might be dead and (laughs) <laughs> I've, I've kind of framed it around the current set of players and stuff so uh yeah i am very much like, like and i've also got in place you know traps for silence and so they can't 
they can't interrupt him. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, be quiet. I got a thing to say. Yeah. Come on, humor me. I've, I've humored you guys for like so long. You got to give me this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that big like holier than thou. Well, you guys have a closed mind view, uh, you know, world view. Here's the reasons why my thing is good and actually i'm the good guy and you're the bad guys and that even leaves space for it probably won't happen because you know it's not necessarily how adventure party works but someone be like he's right you know like what are we doing here that's that's what i want if that happens i will be like so ecstatic like mission complete (laughs) yeah that's great i i've already told my dm i have a plan you know when we get close to the end of this campaign my character has a you know part of his backstory or secret or whatever. He has a thing that he wants to do, and it's going to happen regardless mm. of what everyone else wants to. Do. And it's not a it's not a you know going into business for myself like a, a my my character kind of a thing. It's like mm-hmm. I'm letting you know now, and I'm doing things throughout the campaign that will lead to that. And I'll kind of let some people in on it, but like when it gets to this part, it's like, are you going to do this or do that? And like he's going to do that. Mm. Like this is what it's not a secret this is what he's going to do mm-hmm. so i love the idea of, of the bad guys like this is what i'm going to do hopefully you guys pay attention but like i've got this thing and then i again if a if a character has a second thought about it i would that's the best part like that oh my character i wrote actually did a thing that i wanted him to do mm. Mm. yeah i'm really i'm really looking forward to that to that moment have you had any other any other thoughts or anything else that we might have missed on today's topic? No, nothing I can think of. Yeah, I mean, archetypes are, you know, it's a good and bad thing. I think it's mostly good. Again, normally there are archetypes because they work. Mm-hmm. Um, there's could be good and bad, but I think there's more good there than bad. And then playing against an archetype is extremely fun. That's all mm-hmm. I'll say. Try thinking of something that you know, normally, you know, uh, Jack Sparrow, swashbuckling mm-hmm. rogue, and just... Give yourself like a seven decks and just have fun <laughs> being a bumbling <laughs> idiot who's just extremely lucky, like Jack Sparrow, except for you don't actually – maybe things don't actually work out for you all the time like mm-hmm. they do. Like that's a fun time. But yeah, I, they're fun to play around with. They're fun to change up. I think they're there for, for a reason and yeah, it, it's always a good time to, to mess around with them. Yeah. I think I think we said that like use them as a tool in your utility belt that – players have to help guide or to help make something but then yeah don't be afraid to twist them up and and build on top of them to make things your own and i think there is you know just to to look back a little bit there is a a place still for you know it's all all well and good to have academic like i want my villain to be the good guy and and this and the other but i still think there's a a really genuine place for just like bad dudes (laughs) Oh, yeah, I could just straight up be, oh, no, I'm just evil. Like, yeah. I, I, I want to kill, I just want to kill, the, like, I'm a god, and, and I feel like this world should be destroyed. Like, deal with it. I don't have to mm. explain anything to you. I'm a god. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Just There's a place for that. The indifference of gods. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Well, uh, that, that that pretty much brings us to the end, and we, we've, we've covered a whole bunch of stuff there, and I'm really happy with, uh, obviously, Google's input. Thanks. Our, <laughs> right, a surprise guest uh, halfway through. Um, thank you for for coming on. Is there anything you like to plug? Well, yeah, I just want to thank you for having me on. This is a, a topic I like a lot, and I appreciate you giving me a chance to talk about it. No worries. Yeah, just follow me on Twitter at Adam Gumby. That's where I'll you know retweet stuff from my D and D podcast. I'll misfit roles anytime I do you know talk about video games or anytime I'm doing anything. At Adam Gumby on Twitter is, is the quickest and easiest place. So check it out. Check out the stuff I make and edit and hope you guys enjoy. Excellent. Cool. Uh, thanks again for coming on. And thank you all for listening at home. You can find me on my socials and I'd love to hear from you guys and any experiences you've had with those classic archetypes. Otherwise, thank you all for listening and good night. <laughs>